Chapter 15 Well, we judged that three nights more would fetch us to Cairo, at the bottom of Illinois, where the Ohio River comes in, and that was what we was after. We would sell the raft and get on a steamboat and go way up the Ohio amongst the free states, and then be out of trouble. Well, the second night a fog begun to come on, and we made for a towhead to Taihu, for it wouldn't do to try to run in a fog. But when I paddled ahead in the canoe, with the line to make fast, there weren't anything but little saplings to tie to. I passed the line around one of them right on the edge of the cut bank, but there was a stiff current, and the raft come a-booming down so lively she tore it out by the roots, and away she went. I see the fog closing down, and it made me so sick and scared I couldn't budge for most half a minute, it seemed to me. And then there weren't no raft in sight. I couldn't see twenty yards. I jumped into the canoe and run back to the stern and grabbed the paddle and set her back a stroke. But she didn't come. I was in such a hurry I hadn't untied her. I got up and tried to untie her, but I was so excited my hands shook so I couldn't hardly do anything with them. As soon as I got started, I took out after the raft, hot and heavy, right down the towhead. And that was all right as far as it went, but the towhead weren't sixty yards long. And the minute I flew by the foot of it, I shot out in the whole solid white of fog and hadn't no more idea which way I was going than a dead man. Thinks I, it won't do no good to paddle. First I know I'll run into a bank or a towhead or something. I got to set sail and float. And yet it's mighty fidgety business to have to hold your hand still at such a time. I whooped and listened. Away down there somewheres I hears a small whoop and it sp up comes my spirits, and I want to tear in after it, listening sh sharp to it again. Next time I, I, the next time I come, I see I weren't heading for it, but heading away to the right of it. And the next time I was heading away to the left of it, not gaining on it much neither, for I was flying around this way and that and the other, and it was going straight ahead all the time. I did wish the fool would think to beat a pan and beat it all the time, but he never did. And it was the still places between the whoops that was making trouble for me. Well, I fought along, and directly I hears the whoop behind me. I was all tangled good now. That was somebody else's whoop, or else I was turned around. I throwed the paddle down. I heard the whoop again, but it was diff behind me yet again, and come from a different place. It kept coming, changing its place, and I kept answering it, till by and by it was in front of me again. And I knowed the current had swung the ca canoe's head downstream, and that I was all right if Jim, was, if that was Jim, and not some raftsman hollering. But I couldn't tell for nothing about voices in a fog, for nothing don't look natural, nor sound natural, in a fog. The whooping went on, and about a minute I come a booming down on a cut bank with smoky ghosts of big trees on it. And the current throwed me off to the left and shot by, amongst all the snags that was flare fairly roared, and the current was a tearing by of them so swift. Another second or two, it was all solid white again, and still again. I sit perfectly still then, listening to my heart thump. I reckon I didn't draw a breath till it thumped another hundred. I just give up then. I knowed what the matter was. That cut bank was an island. And Jim had gone down the other side of it. There weren't no towhead that I could float by in ten minutes. It had the big timber of a regular island. It might be five or six miles long, more than a half mile wide. And I kept quiet, my ears cocked, about fifteen minutes, I reckon. I was floating along, of course, four or five miles an hour. But you don't ever think of that. No, you don't feel like you're, you feel like you're laying dead still on the water. And if a little glimpse of a snag slips by, you don't think to yourself, that's how fast you're going. But you catch your breath and think, my, that snag's tearing along. But you think it ain't dismal and lonesome out in the fog? That way by yourself? You try it once. You'll see. Next, about half an hour, I whoops now and then. And at last, I answers a long ways off and tries to follow it. But I couldn't do it. And directly I judged I got into a nest of towheads. For I had a little dim glimpses of them now on both sides of me, 
Sometimes just narrow channel in between. And I saw some that I couldn't some that I couldn't see, I know that was there because I hear the wash of the current against the old dead brush and the trash that hung along the banks. Well, I weren't long in loosening the whoops amongst the towheads. I only tried to chase them a little while, and anyway, because it was worse than chasing a jack-o'-lantern. You never know such a sound to, to dodge around so, swap places so quick, so much. I had to claw away from the bank pretty lively four or five times to keep from getting knocking the islands of the river. And so I judged the rev raft must be bumping into the bank every now and again or else it would get further ahead and clear out of the hearing. It was floating a little faster than I was. Well, I seemed to be in the open river again by and by, but I couldn't hear no sign of whoops, no wares. I reckon Jim had fetched up on a snag, maybe, and was all up with him. I was good and tired. So I laid down in the canoe and said I wouldn't bother no more. I didn't want to go to sleep, of course, but I was so sleepy I couldn't help it. So I thought I would just take a little cat nap. But I reckon it was more than a cat nap, for when I waked up, the stars were shining bright and the fog was all gone, and I was spinning down a big bend stern first. First, I didn't know where I was. I thought I was dreaming. And when things began to come back to me, they seemed to become out of dim out of last week. It was a monstrous big river here, with the tallest and thickest kind of timber on both banks, just a solid wall, as well as I could see by the stars anyway. I looked away downstream and seen a black speck on the water, and I took after it. But when I got to it, it weren't nothing but a couple of saw logs made fast together. Then I seen another speck, and I chased that, and then another. And this time, I was right. It was the raft. When I got to it, Jim was sitting down there with his head down between his knees, asleep, with his right hand hanging over the steering oar. The other oar was smashed off, and the raft was littered up with leaves and branches and dirt. So she'd had a rough time. Well, I made fast and laid down under Jim's nose under the raft, and began to gap and stretch, my fist out against Jim and says, Oh, hello, Jim. Have I been asleep? Why didn't you stir me up? Goodness gracious, is that you, Hook? And you ain't dead? You ain't drowned? You back again? It's too good to be true, honey. It's too good to be true. Let me look at you, child. Let me feel of you. No, you ain't dead. You's back again. Why am I sound? Just the same as the old Hook. The same old Hook. Thanks to goodness. What's the matter with you, Jim? You been a drink? Drinking? Has I been a drinking? Has I had a chance to be drinking? Well, then, what makes you talk so wild? How does I talk wild? How? Why ain't you been talking about me coming back and all this stuff as if I'd been gone away? Huck, Huck Mallet Finn, now you look me in the eye. You look me in the eye. Ain't you been gone away? Gone away? Why, what in the nation do you mean? I ain't gone anywheres. Where would I go to? Well, looky here, Huck. Boss says there's something wrong, Daz. Is it I? Me? Or who is I? Is I here? Or what is I? Now, that's what I want to know. Well, I think you're here plain enough. Well, I think you're tangle-headed, you old fool, Jim. Is I? Is I? Well, you answer me this. Didn't you tow out the line and make the canoe fire the fast for the towhead? Well, no, I didn't. What towhead? I ain't seen no towhead. You ain't seen no towhead. Look here. Didn't the line pull loose and the raft go humming down the river and leave you in the canoe behind in the fog? What fog, Jim? Why, the fog. The fog that's been around all night. And didn't you whoop, and didn't I whoop, and didn't we get all mixed up in the islands, and one or another just lost another, just as good as lost? Because I didn't know what was what, and didn't I bust up again and lauded the islands, and have a terrible time, and most get drowned? Ain't that so? Ain't that so, Hook? You answer me that. Well, this is too many for me, Jim. I ain't seen no fog, nor no islands. 
nor no troubles, nor nothing. I've been sitting here talking with you all night till you went to sleep about ten minutes ago, and I reckon I'd done the same. You couldn't have got drunk in that time. So, of course, you've been dreaming, Jim. Dad, fetch you, how's I going to dream all that in ten minutes? Well, hang it all, you did dream it. Because there ain't any of it here. But, Huck, it was just as plain to me as... It don't make no difference how plain it is, Jim. There ain't nothing in it. I know, because I've been here the whole time. Well, Jim didn't say anything for about five minutes, but sat there, studying it over. And he says, Well, then, Huck, I reckon I did dream it. But dog my cats, if it wasn't the powerfulest dream I ever did see. And I ain't ever had no dream before that's tired me out like this one. Oh. Well, that's all right. Because a dream does tire a body out like everything else sometimes. But this was one staving dream. Tell me all about it, Jim. So Jim went to work and told me the whole thing right through, just as it happened. Only painted it up considerable. And then he must start in and interpret it. Because for if it was sent as a warning or something. Because if it was a dream, it had to be some kind of warning. Well, he said the first towhead stood for a man that would try to do us some good. But the current was another man would try to get away from us. And the whoops was warnings that would come to us every now and then. And if we didn't try to hard to make understand what there was, they'd just, just take us into bad luck instead of keeping us out of it. And the lot of towheads was troubles we was going to get into with some quarrelsome people, small kinds of mean folks. But if we minded our business and didn't talk back and aggravate them, we would pull through and get out of the fog and get into the clear big river again, which was the free states, and then we wouldn't have no more trouble. That's how Jim interpreted it. It had clouded up pretty dark just after I got on the raft, but it was clearing up again now. And I says, oh, well, that's all interpreted well enough as far as it goes, Jim. But what does these things stand for? And it was all the leaves and rubbish on the raft and the smash door. You can see them first rate right now. Well, Jim, he looked at the trash, and then he looked at me, and he looked back at the trash again. He had got the dream fixed so strong in his head that he couldn't seem to shake it loose and get the facts back into place again right away. But when he did get the thing straightened out, and he looked at me steady, without ever smiling, he says, What do they stand for? I was going to tell you what they stand for. I got all wore out with the work, and with the call on you, and went to sleep, my heart was most broke because you was lost, and I didn't care no more what become of me or the raft. And I wake up and you all fine again, all safe and sound, and the tears come, and I could have got down on my knees and kissed your foot because I was so thankful. And all you was thinking about was how you could make a fool of old Jim with a lie. That truck there, that's trash. And trash is what people that is that puts on dirt over the head of those friends and makes them ashamed. Well, he, Jim, he got up slow and walked to the wigwam and went in there without saying anything but that. But that was enough. It made me feel so mean. I could almost kiss his, his foot to get, to get him to take it back. It was 15 minutes before I could work up myself to go and hum humble myself to a nigger. But I'd done it, and I weren't ever sorry afterwards, neither. I didn't do him no more mean tricks, and I wouldn't have done that one if I'd known the way it'd make him feel. And that is the end of chapter 15. And it's kind of ugly there, where Huck is feeling pretty crappy about himself because he had a apologize to a nigger. And I gotta say again, I'm not comfortable saying that. Um, and I think that's that's a watershed moment for Huck right there. That's the t first time that he really has to reconcile with himself that for all his talk, Jim's got feelings. Jim's a person. And he thought of Jim as, you know, regular Joe before then, but 
he never really thought of Jim with all the depth of character as, as he would have. But he does now. And uh, this is about where the book starts to take a serious turn in Mark Twain's writing. He has gone back and edited since then multiple times, as any good writer does. Um, but it was at this moment for Mark Twain, when he was writing it, that he had to come to a bit of a reckoning of himself. Um, and he did. And I like to think that he does. And that's, that's right there is kind of the crux of the debate of this book. How we can say those words. And they don't mean anything, because they don't mean anything to us, because they're not really real. But this is the moment where it becomes real for Huck. He knows a black man. And now he knows that black isn't the defining characteristic of that term. It's man. And we'll see where we go from here.